Hi folks, good evening and thank you so much for joining me. The music you would have been hearing in the background is from the Bajan Soka Band, Spice and Company. I have forgotten how old that song is. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that song would have come out like late 80s, early 90s and it's called Guns. Too many guns, right? Too many guns in this town. So I wanted to start off with something that was thematic, something that um, would draw us into a particular position because... We have some, we have plenty, plenty gun talk this evening. <laughs> this evening is our evening of gun talk. Gun talk left, right and center. Some of the talk I will be talking and some of the talk I'm going to allow other people to talk. So you all will be in a position to listen to other people talk about guns um, and ammo and gun related things, right? But before I jump into to all of that, let me say hello to... Um, to my peoples, Edith Ann, Janelle Sbeth, um, Demita, Demita Maria, I hope I got that correct, Demita Maria, Shakira, Anne McCarthy, Gerard, Carla, McIntyre, nice to see you, um, 29 Super C, I'm not sure if that's your name or your, your YouTube handle, um, Jacqueline Etienne, Maria Charles, Len Lees, David Vincent, hi Helen, how are you doing, Natalie Humphrey, Merlin? Good evening to all of you and thank you so much for joining me this evening because I know, you know, since for the most part restrictions are done, finished, over with, there's so many other things, other activities taking place and all you could use all your time, you know, to go to those things. And that's partly too why I have the program on YouTube. So you don't have to sit down and watch it live. You don't have to wait to... Um, to, for it to come live on Facebook. You can look at it live on YouTube if you so desire by finding the channel News Source and clicking like and subscribing to the channel and also subscribing to notifications. Or you could come and log on to YouTube after when you have time, when you're cleaning, you know, you're cleaning the house, you're on your way to work, you're stuck in traffic somewhere because there's always traffic somewhere in Trinidad at some point in time, Trinidad and Tobago at some point in time. So you could put it on and listen to it while you are going about your daily life, you know, whatever your daily life is. Um, and so hopefully you all are enjoying the content that we are putting together here. And I say we because it's not just myself. There is tech guy involved. I have someone who does research for me on a freelance basis. And of course, the two dogs, Starboy and Stella. Starboy and Stella pay, play a very important role in what happens here because they keep my company while I am putting together the content and figuring out what I'm going to play, what I'm going to do, etc., etc., etc. Right? So I have to, I have to big up my crew. I have to make sure people understand that is not me alone that's doing this. Always just my face and my voice that you tend to see and hear. Hi, Gerard. Hi, Marion. Hi, Cleavy. Um. <laughs> He says, it seems Mr. Griff put things in place for check and balance for FUL to occur, but I didn't see the evidence. Oh, um, well, we're going to get into some of that this evening. Hi, Jelani. Hi, Karen. Hi, Paula. Hi, Tika or Teka, George. Um, Rosano, Caso Daulap, Jamelia. Hi, Jamelia, Allison, Cindy. Hello to all of you. So many of you on here. So I'm, you know, I'm always very happy for the support on evenings. So let me get into it. All right, let's 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 get cracking. Let's get cracking. First off, I want to start with good news because we're going to be talking about some very heavy things later on in the live. So I feel like it's good for us to start off with some good news. Um, and the first good news is this guy here. This is Dylan Carter, Trinbegonian, um, who is a swimmer and he has been burning up swimming the, the, the swimming pool this last week here and has won a number of gold medals. I've, I've forgotten. I've lost count. I lost count when he hit six gold medals. In any case, I just wanted to say congratulations to, to, to Dylan Carter and um, thank you so much for making us proud for, you know, for doing things in the pool this week and making us very proud. Hi, Denzel. Nice to see you. Hi, Rosandra. Hi, Ayana. Nice to see all of you. Hi, Jason, Allison, Friday, all of you that are there. So that it, I was very happy about the swimming news, the news coming out of swimming this week i was like yeah you know something to be happy about some you know something positive and good to be talking about because when you see the headlines the headlines are 
there's a lot of like trauma in our headlines which is not to say i'm not going to say that we don't have bad news here we do have bad news but the headlines seem to focus only on the negative things day after day after day so it's almost like traumatic porn to go through news stories right it's like you know trauma porn at its best oh he's one nine and all good i wasn't sure if it was if it, how much more beyond six because i counted up to six i followed up to six and then i heard that he had gotten a couple more so i was thinking maybe he got as many as 12 but all right so nine and all good congratulations dylan on the great job that you've been doing in swimming and repping trinidad and tobago and you know ha having us have some good things you know good things to talk about good good things to feel good about the other thing that i was happy to hear about is that the in the pennywise heist and you all know that heist took place a couple what about a month ago um a month and a half that heist would have taken place and it rocked us we were all very traumatized by the heist because of the nature of it, the brazenness of it, and of course the the deaths that occurred, so it would have been one of those. It was one of those one of um you know one of any number of crimes here because there are a number of crimes that take place here that have us all um that have us all you know shaken up, but uh the 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 Pennywise high certainly had us very 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 traumatized, and it was all we were talking about for at least a week. Um, so it's good to hear that a soldier has been charged and he is one of um, a few persons, well, I think one of about four persons that has been charged with murder in that heist. So I'm hoping that as the days and weeks and months progress, we will hear, we'll be hearing more. Yes, Alicia, they charged the soldier. So the soldier was charged. I would have heard about it today, is Sunday, right? I heard about it Saturday morning. Friday night into Saturday morning that the soldier was going to be charged or about to be charged and I believe the charges took place on Saturday and well of course it was announced in the newspapers today that the soldier was charged and that is the end of the good news that we're going to be looking at so thereafter brace all yourself because you know we get we we go from some funny bad news to some not so funny bad news so the next thing I want to talk about is doxing now doxing in trinidad and tobago is not yet a crime it's a crime in other parts of the world it's a crime in other parts of the commonwealth but in trinidad and tobago we have not yet made doxing a crime some of you might be wondering pray tell rhoda what is doxing doxing is when you take people personal information things like their phone number things like their address and you put it up in a public space, especially if you put it up in a public space like social media and you allow it to spread, to share, to become public information. So you take somebody's private information, somebody's personal information. So it could be medical records. It could be education records. It could be address, phone number, things that they can indeed and in fact keep private things that are not necessarily for public consumption and you put it out into the public domain that happened to me a couple years ago it happened to me in 2020 where um Devon Maraj and we have spoken about it publicly I have spoken about it publicly and I've spoken to him about it on this um program on publicly where he got um a copy of a contract that I would have signed back in 2020 when I was then a consultant with NLCB because I'm not and people still talk about me as if I'm currently a consultant at NLCB but the last time I was a consultant there was was 2020 and put all of my public information all of my personal information sorry in the public domain so my address my phone number so now all kinds of people know precisely where I live. They know how to find me. They have access to my phone number. They can call and harass, and they have called and harassed, and they have sent mail to my um, home address, and they have, you know, they've said things and sent messages to make me feel unsafe. That is what doxing is. And we had Philip Edward Alexander putting up this photograph. Somebody would have 
blurred out the number of the car and he put up the photograph of um um mp scotland filling gas in his um filling gas in his suv um and poking fun at um mp scotland poking fun at mp scotland because of course mp scotland would have made a statement a couple well not a couple weeks ago now because budget reads in september and we in november so um mp scotland would have made a comment sometime in september yeah late september or very early october about coal pot and bicycles that got people very ticked off and a week after the comment was made he would have apologized for it and we talked about the tone deaf statement and we also talked about the apology so on facebook the license plate number was on full display so the man vehicle personal vehicle because whether he buy it through a tax exemption or not this that tax exemption is part of his remuneration package so i don't know if this was a vehicle that would have been purchased prior to him being an mp i i don't know i can't say for certain or if it was or if it was uh or, or if the vehicle was purchased subsequent to him becoming an mp and so of course he would have been in a position to access the tax exemption either which way the tax exemption is part of his remuneration package so he can access it and he would have to use his money to be able to purchase the vehicle because remember you still have to pay for the the, the actual um sh showroom price of the vehicle when i say showroom the actual cost of the vehicle you're not paying vat you're not paying customs and excise and stuff but you are still paying for the vehicle so this is a man personal vehicle and yes it is his personal vehicle to do his job as an mp why are you going to put it are you going to put the, 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 the license plate number out there? You don't know what he's dealing up with. You don't know if it's a situation where he wants to be able to move around with some degree of anonymity. Right? This is a country where every day we are lamenting what's going on with crime. And this is, where, this is what this is heading back to. Right? Every day we are talking about crime. Every day. We're looking at statistics and we're counting statistics. This is a society, and when I say counting statistics, dead bodies. This is, a, this is a society that is obsessed with counting dead bodies. We are obsessed with it. And we are obsessed with it because media are obsessed with it. So every day there is a running tally on the front page of, a, of at least one newspaper, if not all three. Running tally on the front page of a newspaper about how many deaths there have been how many murders how many killings there have been in the country that's the kind of thing that's the kind of information we have running on the front page when we are running deaths on the front page we're running how many people covid positive on the front page that's the kind of stuff the media runs with on a regular basis and that's why i tell you news here now is like porn it is traumatic porn trauma porn so if you want to get up when the day come and clutch your pearls and feel depressed and feel anxious and feel unsafe all you need to do is go to the front page of a newspaper nothing else all you need to do is go to the front page of a newspaper if you want to get up and not feel depressed and anxious and unsafe you just don't look at the front page of the newspaper which is not to say that which is not to say that I am saying that it makes you safer. I'm just saying that it makes you less anxious. So I just wait a while before I read the news on mornings now. I don't get up and immediately pick up my phone and go straight to the news stories. I just wait until like 8, 9 o'clock. So I just do other things. Play with my dog. Fix myself a nice breakfast. Watch something entertaining or watch something informative. And then check out news. Why? Because news here, our front page stories and the headlines oh my goodness the stress and the anxiety so this went up on social media and then check out the next thing that happened a unc counselor counselor adrian ali put up the certified copy of the vehicle the certified copy you know so adrian ali get scotland's 
certified copy. The cert, listen, <laughs> this is a document that's supposed to be inside licensing office, right? And if this document inside licensing office, then it means that is only public servants inside the Ministry of Works and Transportation and Scotland who are supposed to have this. So how Councillor Adrian Ali get this certified copy of the vehicle to put up, right? To post up on his social media pages. And I'm like, what I have to do with the district of Monroe Road and Carney Savannah? What MP Scotland's certified copy for a vehicle that he owns? What I have to do with local government issues? And you put up the certified copy, and he ain't put up the certified copy like this because eh? it's I who ink out the information. All I wanted Oli to see was that a certified copy was put up by Councillor Adrian Ali. Me, I want Oli to know whose certified copy it was. Me, I want Oli to see the license and registration number for the vehicle. Me, I want Oli to see who is the owner of the vehicle. What I will tell you all is this. The certified copy that he put up was linked to the vehicle that MP Scotland was driving. The UNC, every Monday morning, and Tuesday morning, and Wednesday morning, and Thursday morning, and Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning, will get up and carry on left, right, and center about how much crime taking place in this country. And every Monday night, when Kamala meet to discuss things at Chief Forum, she will meet at Chief Forum and she will talk about crime, but they are not thinking about the ways in which they are contributing to, to criminal activity in this country. So you have a councillor who get a copy of MP Scotland's certified copy, right? How that happen? One, and when you put out a document, a, a document that ain't, this, ain't, this document ain't for public consumption. People certified copy or ownership of the vehicle, that's not, for, that's not for public consumption. When you put that information out and you put it out undoctored with all the information there and people know where the man, where, where the man living, he family, the car, the vehicle, what, what are you doing? When you're putting up people information like that, now if something happens, now if somebody decides that they want to target MP Scotland, who, how are we going to apportion blame? How? And the United National Congress will never see that what they have done there is wrong. Even though it's not illegal in Trinidad and Tobago yet. And I really and truly feel the Attorney General needs to put the cyber crime, put, have cyber... Have cybercrime legislation be higher up on the legislative agenda, right? Because you see this kind of foolishness, that is madness. To be putting people personal information out there like that. So madness, utter madness. So I saw that and I thought to myself, well, I think the UNC just stop and think at any point in time. We shouldn't be doing things like this. We shouldn't be endangering people's lives like that. We shouldn't be putting people's pub personal information out in the public domain like that. Because it could lead to a situ it could lead to it could lead to sticky situations. Like why would you do something like that? And yes, Terence, you are absolutely correct. Media in the country just do the same thing. Put out people personal information, put up information, people address their phone number, all kind of thing in news stories, put face that they shouldn't be putting faces to in stories. Right? This story, I'm going to be referencing a story in a little, in a little bit. I'm going, actually, I'm going to be putting up a front page in a little bit, right? Of minors and only have their face, right? You ain't blur and obscure their face or anything like that. So just because the face behind a mask doesn't mean that you should not obscure the face. So I'm there wondering where the ethics, right? Because let's let us for the sake of argument go down the path of well there is no law saying that you can't 
put out people's information like that. Where are your ethics? Where are your ethics? So, that's a doxing situation. But I want to come to, I want to come to this situation with the children, right? And I want to talk about the tone deafness. Let me tell you something. There are lots of people that are tired of politics, right? I don't give them wrong for being tired of politics. There are lots of people that are currently tired of the sitting government. I don't give them wrong for being tired of the sitting government either. Especially when the sitting government is not really putting its best foot forward on a number of public issues, like very public issues. So this thing happens, this Rose Hill situation. And this is one of the things I get my vex. Express could have blur them two little girl face. Yeah, because everybody knew what the story was about, right? And a headline done saying, get down children. So blur their faces, entirely blur their faces. Not because their face behind mask and it have chair leg and thing there. Blur their faces. If all is seriously interested in the public and benefiting the public with the type of reporting and journalism you're doing, blur their faces. So this happens, this situation. And I want to tell you, when I heard the story, when I was, when things were circulating the video and all of those things were circulating i was like oh my god the trauma that these little children are experiencing on a daily basis as a matter of course right so you hear gunshots and you as a child as a toddler as a little child you are already conditioned to drop to the ground and be as quiet as possible until the bullets stop firing and we think it is safe so i thought to myself i was there thinking to myself we really hit some lows you know we have really as a society as a culture we have really hit some lows and there are dysfunctional things that are happening with us as a society the we have to come to terms with, we have to, we have to come to grips with, we have to openly talk about, we have to challenge. And I've decided after I've done one or two more lives about crime related issues, I want to switch my content to talking about, um, men, well, I guess more psychological type issues, right? Because I feel there are ways in which our psyche here as a society is scarred. You know, we battered and abused in certain ways. Like there's a lot of trauma, a lot of, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of crisis we're dealing with on a regular basis. And I don't know how much of it we're actively processing and dealing with. So I feel that we should be talking about those things. So after we see this front page, and those of you who would have seen the video with the children that was circulating saw that video. We get treated. <laughs> hey, 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 listen. We get treated to this. Now, I feel that Fitzgerald Hines doesn't know when not to speak. I think he's unaware of the. I think he's unaware of when when it's appropriate and inappropriate, and it's not just based on this. There have been a number of other posts that I've seen from MP Hines. And I've paused and I've said to myself, by now, the PNM's public relations officer should have had a conversation with MP Hines to say to him, this is not how you go about communicating thoughts, ideas to the public, right? I also felt 
that the corporate communications minister well the let me say the communications not corporate communications the communications minister for the government also needed to have a conversation with Heinz and say hey you're damaging the government brand right you're damaging the government brand and I feel that the Prime Minister who is responsible for Heinz being an MP because he would have selected Heinz well, the Prime Minister as political leader of the People's National Movement would have selected Heinz to run as an MP and the Prime Minister as the head of the cabinet would have appointed Heinz to the portfolio the various portfolios that he has held now the portfolio of national security I feel the Prime Minister should pull Heinz into a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting. He ain't had to discuss it in front of the entire cabinet. And say to him, hey, you need to hire a communication specialist to assist you with how you are getting your messaging out. Not just on your social media profile and pages, but from a national security perspective. Because I don't know if MP Hines knows this. I don't know if this has come if this has been brought to his attention. But there's a significant portion of the population, regardless of which party they have voted for, that has a that has that have questions about his effectiveness as the Minister of National Security. And this post here, apart from it undermining his authority as Minister of National Security, lacks emotional intelligence and empathy. I read this post and I was like, how is it possible for one person to not read the room so badly? Like, how? And then you put the post up. And you ain't take the post down. So you have decided, I have misread the room. I have offended the room. But I stand in by my offensive position. So let's go through it. The video of the children of the Rose Hill RC School in Laventy laying them themselves onto the ground at the sound of automatic gunfire and in which the voice of the teacher telling them, shh, signaling that they kept quiet was quite misleading. The video was not misleading. The video showed you what it showed you. The video showed you children on the ground being told by their teacher, shh, while they wait, awaited bullets to stop flying. You could be forgiven for thinking that gunmen were actually on the compound. They were not. In fact, the actual shooting took place about 200 meters away. Listen, I kill Kite when I read that sentence, you know. I kill Kite when I read that sentence, you know. I put on my phone and I say to myself, no, nah, me and just read what it is I just read. A whole post was not made to tell me or to tell whoever it is reading it that the bullets wasn't on the compound. The bullets was 200 meters away. That is craziness. The issue here is not just about the proximity of bullets, you know. The issue here is that these children at their tender age have to stop, drop and roll and hide under desks because the bullets could be on the compound. So whether or not the bullets was there, the fact of the matter is they have to do it because the bullets might be on the compound. They don't know. They're in a classroom. They're in a classroom where they should be safe. They shouldn't even have to be thinking about gunshots on the school compound or in the vicinity of the school or 200 meters away from the school. Right? So it doesn't matter if the gun, if the, the, the actual shooting was 20 meters away or 2 meters away. It is that there was a shooting and it was close enough for the children to hear. And the children had to function in a moment of crisis. It's not it. All it help. All it pardon, pardon me here. Big hardback me. I living in four roads. 
and you just be living in four roads and you just hear gunshot in La Puerta and you just hear gunshot on the Pitti Valley side because there was an evening a man get murdered up on a ridge on the Pitti Valley side and I sit down in my yard down in four roads but because it's hillside and hillside and I down in a valley you just hear everything that happening on the hillside down inside the valley so I sit down in my yard and I hear a range of bullets da, 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 da. and me and all the other neighbors cluster and wondering where them bullets fly so boy who get shot boy and of course we nervous we know that the bullets didn't happen two meters away 20 meters away or even 200 meters away but the mere fact that you were sitting down in your yard in the evening right four five six o'clock in the evening and you hear this loud report of bullets like that so and you know somebody get gunned down and then not too long after that you're hearing the ambulance siren and them you're hearing the police siren and them and you're thinking to yourself hey boy somebody else get killed murder just so normal 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 on an evening so i read this and i thought to myself this is how you're defending this is how you think you should be defending what's going on with crime in our society by coming out and saying okay the crime happened but it didn't happen as close as we thought it happened or it didn't happen as close as the video suggested it happened <sighs> minister Hines there are a couple people that you need to hire you need to hire an organizational psychologist to work with you and your organization with respect to how you all are dealing with things and you need to hire a communications advisor not just for your personal social media interactions but also for the interactions of your ministry because this here nobody has signed up for this nobody has signed up for this at all the more i sit and i think to myself you're being paid a salary you, you're hired by the public by the public right because you are a public servant as a minister as a minister of government you are a public servant no we ain't paying for this no mm -mm. no 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 and nothing else to say just no right just no I don't Justin you're asking a very good question I don't know if he's humble enough like I said this is not the first time that I've seen posts from him that in my opinion are incredibly tone deaf and I am wondering at the emotional intelligence of the government right and there are num there are number of there are number of posts that I've seen and I'm like okay all right why are you all thinking that it's okay to speak to the population like this number one you're adopting a very paternalistic attitude as in you're talking down to the population as if you are our parents you're not our parents and we are the population is a thinking population right i mean i might get annoyed at some things that this that at some kinds of discussions that we have from time to time but the population is a thinking population and people is you know they they, they know when things are wrong they know when things have not been said or done the right way. Sometimes they can't articulate why it's wrong or why they feel it wrong. But we just know. And as soon as people saw that post, they knew immediately that even though he was trying to explain something, he was doing it the wrong way. It was the wrong way to make the point that he was trying to make. Because the issue here is not how close the bullets were. It is that the bullets were flying in the first place and children had to respond to that kind of trauma. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, how is that difficult to process? To the, I mean, like, how you ain't grasp that? How you felt that this post was necessary? I, listen, 
Me you know what to say again, huh? Me you know what to say again. So, two red men was fighting this week. And I need only to hear <laughs> these red men when they're fighting, right? Now, there's a saying that when two elephants start a fight, the ants and them just move because all that has happened is the grass does get trampled. So when I see two red men fighting, I'm not necessarily going to get involved in the two red men fighting. But I am going to bring it to your attention because it might be an issue of national importance. And why? Because it points to allegations of bribery and corruption in public office. And you never know when these things are going to become more significant. So I want you all to bear with me for a couple of minutes, for about six, seven minutes, and listen to these two red men who are fighting, right? And listen, they're quick to snatch one another wig, you know. Quick, 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 quick to snatch one another wig. So you see, when I see two red men start to grab one another wig, I had to step back. as they come up eh? because I am accustomed to this rodeo now where politicians and I have to call Gary Griffith a politician now politicians try to control the narrative and do everything in their power to keep you from speaking out I want you to hear this exchange that took place today Felicia Holder in a press conference said something Gary responded to that something by telling an interviewer that he is going to sue her. I'm gonna show you where Gary gonna fall on his face with that lawsuit. Listen. I supported Gary as a commissioner of police, but hearing now after the fact, now that he is a political content contender in the race, hearing now of what are, like Philip said, damning allegations of what is misbehaving in public office, hearing it now and not when it happened, just takes us all the way back to email gates and every other time we have heard a politician bust a mark in this country, but hear nothing come as a result of it. And we, the population, are left wondering, okay, so what is the point of this information if, as he's saying, it's so damnable, but nothing can come or happen out of it. You're saying that it's not a criminal act, it's an ethical act. An issue of ethics in this case. So, wouldn't your ethics bothered by the fact that the Prime Minister of a country can come to you as the head of the police service, as the man who's responsible for maintaining law and order, and bribe you in essence with $45 million, and bribe you in essence with $45 million? A few moments later. A few moments later. All right, so Gary, I've been trying to avoid meeting you in the gutter, but I realize the only theater of operations you want to fight this is the gutter. I want to tell you something. You are sounding like a jackass. And I'll tell you why you sound like a jackass, eh, Gary? Because I'm going to play your words. I'm going to play your voice. And what is beating you in the public space, Gary, is the inconsistency of you. Let me show you how you... Philip have receipts. Oh God, Philip have receipts and he going and bring the receipts. Could be more inconsistent than Keith Rowley. Keith Rowley has two tongues. You seem to have three. You are the only person I've ever heard in life take three 
different positions on an issue. Gary Griffith, when you were commissioner of police and the prime minister came to offer you, and I'm going to play his words, eh, but I'm giving you the ball by ball. When the prime minister came to offer you $45 million to hire foreign attorneys, you said that the funds were specifically to hire foreign attorneys to arrest political opponents. You didn't say investigate. You didn't say prosecute. You said arrest. You say arrest. You say the man bribe you to arrest. You said nothing to the public. Something as frightening as a prime minister. And do you know, and, I, and I'm going to give you some information, because the, yesterday we wrote the DPP. Monday we write in the Integrity Commission. And in this video, I'm going to read the laws that were broken according to the Integrity and Public Life Act. This is not going to go away. Gary Griffith is now walking this allegation back. Gary Griffith is the one that is going in the public and fighting to say it's not so bad. It's not so bad. But Gary Griffith said that in any other country, that action would have collapsed the government. So which is it, Gary? And why are you fighting us? We are fighting your cause. You brought this matter into the public space. You wanted to beat us all into a frenzy. You wanted the media to be strong and stand up. But I stood up and we take it to the DPP and we're going to take it to the Integrity Commission. But now you're fighting us and you want to sue Felicia Holder. I want to tell Trinidad and Tobago something for what you just heard, right? Because we will deal with this all over. According to Merriam Webster Dictionary. Philip owns a dictionary. Philip went and consulted a dictionary. All of this thing is heated. Since 1828, definition of bribe, one of two entries. One, money or favor given or promised in order to influence the judgment or conduct of a person in a position of trust. Two, something that serves to induce or influence. Now I want you to hear Gary Griffith's own words. I want you to hear Gary Griffith's own words now. So you'll understand why Gary is making himself an ass. Listen to Gary's words in Gary's voice. This is what started it all. Prime Minister, why did you give a commissioner of police $45 million and tell him these funds are to be used directly to hire foreign attorneys to arrest political opponents? Commissioner of police $45 million and tell him these funds are to be used directly to hire foreign attorneys to arrest political opponents. Any other country in the world is that that will collapse. Now that is the craziest thing that I have. No. I'm trying to get this thing off my screen and it's not going away. Right? It's gone. So Gary said. Prime Minister, why did you give a commissioner of police $45 million and tell him these funds are to be used directly to hire foreign attorneys to arrest political opponents? Gary Griffith said, and according to Miriam Webster, Gary Griffith said that the Prime Minister gave him $45 million and told him those funds were to be used specifically for a purpose. And according to Miriam Webster, money or favor given or promised in order to influence the judgment or conduct of a person in a position of trust. Something that serves to induce or influence. Gary, boy, bring your freaking lawsuit, yes? <gasps> Shots fired. More gun talk. Gun talk, gun talk, gun talk. So imagine Philip. Listen, all here. <laughs> Pot telling kettle the bottom black, you know. <laughs> hey, listen, as I live and breed, imagine pot turn around and tell kettle, hey boy, that bottom you have that sit down on the fire, it black. I am unable, I cannot, I cannot, right? I am unable to can. Only he's mopped this evening now. 
Ease me up this evening. I watching that back and all <laughs> brew whole week and I say to myself, Really boy? That is all yeah? But the two of them didn't the two of them didn't just hug up the other day and was in one another armpit and sit down on one another show and 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 interviewing one another and, and, and was loving up. Wasn't it wasn't love like dog the other day with the two of them? See this is what I tell all you. When two red men decide they're going to fight, all of it, just sit back. Stay to the side. Wine to the side. Drink water, mind your business. Get some popcorn, but do not get involved. Because you see me, I'm not getting inside Philip and Gary business. I'm not getting inside Philip and Gary business. But I will be observing it. I will be observing it. Because, oh my goodness, it's sweet. The Tory hot. The Tory was hot, 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 hot. The tea was real sweet and the tea was hot this week, boy. Two tongue, three tongue, four tongue, and two two black bottom. Oh my word. So that is two red men fighting. Now I wanna I want to switch to the real serious thing. So some more shots going on fire here right now as we move on to the real serious thing. As you would have known, as you all would have observed. There's a new story this week, this past week here, about another woman who has been the victim of um, a domestic violence murder. And I say a domestic violence murder because even though the police are saying that there was no report made to the TTPS of um, domestic violence, if the gentleman show up at the woman's house and they're both intimate partners and he would have been her husband, and he shot at her eight times. <laughs> that is intimate partner violence. And so I would I put it down to intimate uh, an intimate partner murder, right? So the young lady was murdered. They would have gotten married in January, not too long after they got married. They separated. She moved back to her mom's house. And he went to her home early one morning, armed with two guns, took out one gun and shot her about eight times and she got shot to the head etc etc and she has now passed my condolences go out to the family and to the persons that have been making comments about women having to choose their men wisely I want you all to stick around to the end of this live because I have a couple of things that I need to say to you persons that keep talking about women needing to choose their men wisely right and referencing Dr. Rowley and referencing me, um, women making bad choices etc and basically doing victim blaming now, this evening we're going to be talking about legal firearms and the purchase of legal firearms because the firearms that would have been used in that particular murder were legal. The gentleman was, an, was a legal owner. He had at least five FULs to the best of my knowledge based on the newspaper stories that I saw. And he would have gotten his FULs let me double check my data. Let me double check my information. Because I know I, I stored it. I know I put it. I have it on my phone. Um, I, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to see. All right. I don't want to. All right. So the Sunday Express was told Muhammad was granted his first firearm on September 9th, 2019. Since then, he applied for and was granted four further variations. So he had five, gu five guns, sorry, in total, right? So September the 9th, 2019 would have been when he got his first gun. I don't think I need to let to, to remind you all who was the commissioner of police at that point in time. And in short order, he would have gotten four more FULs. Two of these weapons were granted on July the 15th, 2020. One was granted on November the 17th, 2020. And the final one was granted on July the 24th, 2021. You all hearing that? Five, five firearms. Why does one person need five guns? What is he protecting himself from? So, September 9th, first gun. Then two more, July the 15th, 2020. Then another one, November the 17th, 2020. And then July the 24th, 2021. Five guns. And he was armed with two of those guns when he went and he shot his wife. Shot and killed his wife. So, 
I have a next recording that I want Oli to listen to. And this recording is about 15 minutes of this recording that you're going to be listening to. This recording now I want to get back to the proper starting point this recording that I'm going to play for you all happened on the 14th of April 2021 it was a meeting that was held at the police headquarters between members of the police executive and firearms dealers and shooting range operators I am not going to be naming any names. Uh, all you're bright, all you're smart, all you have sense. And I'm sure that, you know, you all, all, everybody is working properly. So April the 14th, 2021, I'm giving you all the dates so that you know that it didn't happen this year. This is not a recent meeting. So it's not a recent recording of a meeting. It is a meeting that would have taken place 14th of April, 2021 at police headquarters. Um, at police headquarters. So let me start. Let me let Oli listen. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, good morning. So this is this is not right. uh, most of you know. This this meeting is not a it's just basically for us to have some some degree of Let me know that y'all are hearing. That we try to understand each other's responsibility. It's an enormous responsibility. And just for us to make sure that we can move forward and in a direction that is not going to cause problems for you and definitely not problems for me. So the things we have taken place over the last few weeks that we need to rectify. So with this, uh, there, there are a lot of things that we intend to do in the very near future. And I, I definitely require your input, your support, your guidance, even how we move the firearm industry in this country. Um, this is where it is, and, and, we, some, and that's why it's very here. It's ready for dialogue. Um, here, there are a couple of things that I would like to have as policies, um, and really policies I would ask. We don't want to have to turn it into having to go to parliament to make it worse. I think if it is that we have some mutual respect for each other, and we understand your responsibility, I think we can all agree to that in moving forward, we have um, a repeat of what we have taken place over the last few weeks in different things. So we'll try to uh, uh, thank you for, for being here. Just like everyone's attendance, it shows that you all fully understand how important this meeting is. Um, there's been a lot that's been going on over the last couple of years. In the last few years, I mean, basically, I've done a lot to try to transform the firearms industry. So, first thing I need to say, this meeting is taking place 14th of April, 2021. Present would be persons from the senior executive of the TTPS, FUL, um, dealers, um, fire, um, for, um, shooting range operators. There's, I think, one person. Um, there's, I think, one person from the EMA present. There's nobody from any legislative arm of the government, and there is nobody. There's nobody from the defense force. There's no representative at all from the defense force. I'm saying those things because they're going to become important in future. You may have to raise the volume on your phone because the recording, the person who did the recording, they would not have been standing up right next to the speakers. So put your headphones on, right? If you can put headphones on and raise the volume and you will be, you ought to be able to hear everything properly. So the first comment that is made there that, that caused me to stop is this whole business of talking about transforming an industry. And so I'll ask you this. Is the role of the TTPS, or is the role of anybody who's at the head of the TTPS, to start an industry and to transform the industry? Or, to speak more specifically, is the TTPS responsible for starting a gun industry and for expanding a gun industry? Is that the role 
of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Um, well, it was just about 200 firearms to be issued. Now it's, the other one was about 2,000. I think I need this bit to be repeated so that you all have a sense of. How important this meeting is. Um, there's been a lot that's been going on over the last couple of years. In the last two years, I've been basically, I've done a lot to try to transform the firearm industry. Um, for it was just about 200 firearms to be in the now it's the other one was about 2,000. We still have about 38,000 out there. And because of that demand and supply, obviously there's going to be concern, there's going to be greed, there's going to be possible corruption, there's going to be persons harassing, frustrated. 10% of my messages I get on my phone is people are asking me for a firearm. And I stay far as far as possible. So it comes up to me when I sign. And, and it takes up most of my weekend signing that real books. Um, so without much further ado, I just want to go into um, everyone is aware of the Jews. So are you guys able here? Yeah, everyone. I am the SP Iran Bello, head of the finance Good day, everyone. Uh, I think I know most of you. My name is Christian Chandra, and you can be your Yes. So just to let you know, for those of you who may not be hearing everything, Nick, the two persons that introduce themselves, one is an ASP and one is the former legal director of the TTPS. And both persons are now currently um, persons of interest in various crimes. Uh, they've, they've both been arrested and charged for crimes in Trinidad and Tobago, right? So they're now both known to the police. Okay. So it's a better you could you could share anything to now. Uh, we'll move straight into the recertification of FUR and FU. Alright, before we go, I just wanna one of the things to deal with us would like us to agree with firearms is not cool meat in Massey or super or night boards where we must do our dispense. Okay? So so the people who love to who are these are participants because I have expanded the firearm industry and now it become it's become competitive. Now we have so many dealers. There's become a point now where all that's left out is the same newspaper by three block getting four one and twenty five percent discount. It's not cool to cut so we sell it in, in, in massive people, please. And it is not to target anyone because several of you all have been advertising on social media. So that was that is what started the ball rolling. So once somebody opens that up, so a couple of interesting things here. Again, the person talks about expanding the industry and then starts to caution dealers about advertising guns and the ways in which they're advertising guns on social media and continues to speak as if this is some sort of AGM meeting between dealers and suppliers where guns are concerned. And we're going to get into why that's the tone of the meeting. It's a box, it opens it for everyone. It can be right. So we can uh, ask me all in future, let us put an end to this advertising and marketing. Put you know firearm on display as if we selling um, produce in like old supermarket or something is not the way to go. So when he says as if we selling produce, I pause and I thought to myself, the TTPS doesn't sell guns. The TTPS is not a business. The TTPS is a service. And one of the services that the TTPS provides would be FUL will be would be approval and permission, FUL approvals, FUL permission for people to be able to carry guns for personal protection or for sport purposes. So the TTPS is not a business. So then why would anybody from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service be telling a group of businessmen whether they can or cannot advertise their goods and wares and products. Because that struck me as strange that a meeting would be called by the TTPS with FUL dealers to tell the FUL dealers. I mean, this is only one of the things that does covered in the meeting. There are a range of things and you will hear some of it because the meeting was a long meeting. It was over an hour long. But you are there, you called dealers together and you are telling dealers, we shouldn't be advertising. Not you, but we, right? So 
I have expanded this industry. First time I know that the role of the TTPS is to provide entrepreneurial um, avenues for persons in Trinidad and Tobago. I did not realize that the job of the TTPS was to expand industries and set up industries and regulate industries in that way, right? And then to caution persons using the collective first person plural pronoun of we not you but we should not be advertising the sale of guns as if is cold you know as if it's meeting in in massey so i was like okay all right interesting so can you please all agree to refrain from the advertisement with firearms that is not the way we need to go because because i've expanded the industry it means that there's no it, there's heavy competition and because it's so many firearms now being approved, it means that people are trying to advertise. There's no need for that. Let us keep it in home. Remember, he has gone from 200 firearms a year. That was said earlier on. From 200 firearms a year to, well, 200 firearms in total, I believe, having been approved. Now to 2,000 firearms having been approved. And um, 38,000 more approvals that need to be processed and so th that's why we're hearing consistently throughout this about the expanding of the industry right so more persons have been granted approvals for five for fuls or more persons have gotten fuls and since it's gone from 200 to 2000 you all could do the maths and figure out the percentage there it's gone up by more than a hundred percent because a hundred percent would have been 400 persons so when it gone from 200 to 2000 I guess that's like what about two thousand percent? I'm sorry, a thousand percent it has gone up by in terms of approvals. So let us continue. And I don't want to have that thing being marked to, to that extent. Any feedback, any comments, any concerns? Get it. So, the question if I really buy a small from social media, I can subscribe to that email. Yeah, that is. But I would say that these were able to market companies. Well, you could have that. I mean, it, it's a company like, for example, several of you all have security companies with your firearm companies. So, but I just need to make sure that, that the advertisement for firearms and the sphere of firearms is a new thing. So, tell me anything. Advertising. Some of us have to advertise because we are not privy to people's 
approval before the people who themselves have pulled them and say you can buy a firearm. That has been happening. The possible corruption is corruption happening. And therefore, for those small dealers who are trying to survive and who do not network vis-a-vis -vis the various avenues, we are challenged. So I want to make a point here. That person is a dealer. I don't know who the person is and I, I don't need to know who the person is. A dealer, a FUL dealer, is saying to a senior member of the TTPS that corruption is taking place. Why have you not made a report, like a proper report? Because you are in a position where clearly you have direct access to the top tier of the TTPS. You are aware that corruption is taking place. You are aware that it's not a level playing field and that there are things wrong with the process. So why not use that meeting with the top level of the TTPS to discuss the corruption and to bring forth the evidence? Because I would have thought if the senior level of management of the TTPS meeting with FUL dealers, it would be to talk about how to facilitate a more transparent relationship with the two, with both entities in relation to this whole business of FUL and FUL and 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 the and people getting their FULs and then eventually going on to purchase guns. Because I want you all to understand something: FUL dealers are businesses. That's what they are. They don't play a role in the TTPS, right? There is no division, there is no department within the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service call FUL dealers, right? It is a precinct call FUL dealers. You see how we have CID and we have OCNU and we have um, um, interagency task force and we have FI, FIB and we have fraud squad and them kind of things so. And, and 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 the gender based violence unit and child protection unit it didn't have no ful dealers unit so these persons that are sitting there in a meeting with senior levels of the trinidad and tobago police service are not police officers they have no part or role to play in the police service but they are sitting in a meeting with senior members of the police service and casually talking about experiencing corruption. And you notice nobody is asking for details of said corruption. Nobody is saying, well, if you have information, please come forward with your information. So let us, let us continue. And we have to get the word of the public that we are here and we have product. Similar to what other people have. And advertising a legal product is not illegal. So we're talking about now you're asking us to follow a culture that you want us to fulfill by harmonious relationship with you. But some of us are being abused or taken advantage of because we do not go the way of internal information finding. Nice. That's my no, I'm not expanding. Just in future, when you're speaking, you can just identify yourself. So I can just, I know most of the pieces, but just, I mean, all of you all, actually, I, I'm trying to get, I hear you all will be competitors, but they've got, there, there are things I'm going to bring to your attention that I need the unified support from everyone here. They are, they are, the, the, the um, persons who run the ranges, they're also here? Yeah. Right, good. So that as it pertains to ranges and firearms. Going back to, yeah, go ahead. Right, okay. You want to use advertisers. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> yes. I saw a full page, uh, page uh, and I thought that, I mean, I have product food. And I sent my stuff directly to the people, I didn't send it in. So I have 250 people on a WhatsApp broadcast that it went directly to police officers and people who got certificates of competence and so forth. So I had a direct WhatsApp message to people. Yeah, well, see, what you said of firearm, that went all over the country. That happened with it. Yeah, that went to all around the people who were to other people, but that is what advertising does for you. Yeah, but anytime you go down that direction, then I will have to start, I don't have to tighten the belt. You want me to pay. What does that mean about tightening the belt? Because, of course, 
what thus far the conversation is focused on wanting to advertise and wanting to advertise product right and <laughs> that's the, you all here in the conversation i have no i'm still trying to figure out what businessmen advertising their product has to do with the ttps and why the ttps would be saying you can't go down the road of advertising your product it makes no sense to me at all i am here thinking but what role the ttps have to play in a business advertising as product and i want you all to understand something thus far based on what i have listened to the business people here they may doing nothing wrong they get called to a meeting they come this long in the meeting and they're discussing what is they need to discuss with the senior members of the ttps and everybody's having a frank and open conversation about guns and fuls and being able to advertise the product and this industry that has been expanded we need, we need a level playing field like this, sir. So. No problem, but we cannot, it can't be based on advertising like that. Well, the policy is we are really happy for this meeting because what they said in communication with all of us and being on one agenda is good. But explain, you see, I mean, this is what I want to make sure. I do not want monopoly, I don't want abuse. So, what it is pertaining to the small firearm dealer? What is the concern that you have? Well, there, there's people who get. Communication with people how um, so you know what I mean. I'm not the radar spell, right? But the idea oh, is you open. Okay, but well then the, the corruption is vast and far and you are doing a lot, a lot, a lot of fact that more than any other commissioner. And you're doing a lot of great work, but it is it is going beyond you by What, what can we do? I want I want solutions. Well, alright, so I don't know how you're going to stop corruption in the country anymore. You've got to keep on trying. All right, well, first thing, one of the things I picked up, and I don't want to be interested, one of the things I picked up, the biggest problem I had with the corruption, and this is unofficial, well, it's unofficial, it's just true. Police officers were pulling back a lot in stations, and that has been a big issue. So, as much as. So, this is another red flag for me. We have somebody who is representing the TTPS here saying that police officers were part of some sort of block with the FUL, like the FUL system, right? And I am wondering, if you are aware that police officers were creating a block with the FUL system, did you report it? Or if you are in a position of power, did you then upper, uh, did you organize any sort of investigation or sting operation to be able to catch the police officers that were part of this alleged corruption that you are talking about here and then break the back of the corruption ring that you are claiming to that you are claiming is is present in the in the police force and that you are attempting to to, to clear up like try before the compliance units and blah 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 you know just take a police officer in a station to pull it back and unless it is you give him something he's not going to set it up to the fbi department what i'm trying to know is to eliminate these stations once and for all having the stations limited as much as i did all of this now to stop the corruption the blackmail and the extortion they, once, they, once they hold the file and it can't get to him, it can't get upstairs to me. I sign blindly. On I didn't sign just blind and just sign because when I get 200 or whatever for a week, I will just try to know who it is after they do all the work. It's important <coughs> that this person is saying that he signs blindly. I'm going to get back to why this, is, this comment about signing blindly makes no sense to me at all. But it can't get to me if it is a, a police officer, maybe a station commander, somebody deliberately holding them back. And they are holding back files. And what is very sad is that they are holding back files sometimes on behalf of the person who they support. They are holding back their competitors' files. So it becomes a very nasty game. And that's what I'm trying to tell them to The best way to stop that. So I'm listening to a member of the police service, or a former member of the police service, possibly basically saying that they are aware of corruption they know about the kind of corruption they know what was taking place and what was done was a report made was an investigation started a sting operation did any of this knowledge or information that you have did any of it lead to arrests and charges so 
if you're in a position where you're working in the, the police service and you are aware that there's corruption taking place, wouldn't you try to root the corruption out and get people fired, disciplined, hold people to account and put an end to the practice in and of itself? I am, I am Inspector Griffith, and I, I am a school for station, and the bonds, I'm looking for, for the bonds at the back end, so I decided to pull back for the top of the delivery. I just call the names by the I just, you know, I do bonds already. So, so that, is, that is the way it is good. So the best way to eliminate that is to eliminate the stations. The stations have become the biggest problem. So now it comes straight to the FUL department. One second. Right. I want you all to remember that he says the stations are the biggest problem. The station is where the blockage takes place and that the, now everything comes to the FUL department. And so he has set up a compliance unit within the FUL department and that compliance unit within the FUL department is what is meant to um, solve the problem. I want you all to remember that because I am coming back to it. Bear with me. We here until about nine o'clock. Will minimize police officers being involved in the extortion and blackmail. As it pertains to yourself, you could promote, you could back, but I don't want it to see that advertisement and the photos of the firearms. Again, it's a lot of pressure to put it on you with that. It's not the way to, it's not the way to go. You could nothing wrong with advertising your company. I mean, you might have a tactical here. Uh, a tactical. A tactical or sports and games. All right, you can advertise sports and games. But if you have um, uh, you, one of you will buy down a company that it, it has a firearm name on it, firearm here. Yeah. So, so that makes it um, political, what sports and games is, no? Just because you have the name firearm. So if you advertise advertising, it will be, I'll, I'll be out of place to tell you not to advertise your, your brand or company, but you advertise the product. Right, so it's a lot of that line. All right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's something I can touch on that I believe it makes time. So I've seen this happen where the police station does like literally in the end that when books are coming out, they will actually pass that information to other dealers and those dealers will contact those people directly to advertise directly. I, I'm not talking. So yet another FUL an, another firearms dealer <laughs> is making mention of something that he has seen some part of the process he has seen that is not making sense to do with the fuel um booklets right the when you get the when you get your firearms users license uh, you get a booklet and that booklet is where you register the the, the the gun and your variations and whatever and i see emerald gould is asking a question pressure from who and where exactly i am i am i confused who is putting when businesses are advertising their product how is the commissioner being pressured who is who is he being pressured who is this officer be who he being pressured by who he being pressured by but yet another fu um, firearms dealer is talking about a discrepancy that he has seen and there is no query for information you know who who where did you see this which station which officers no query for that at all so in this meeting people are talking about this industry the expansion of this industry how them going to operate within this industry how they're trying to crack down on corruption in the industry but every single time a conversation comes up about corruption that people claim they have seen or experienced there is no gathering of information or evidence. I talk about what I hear, I talk about what I have, I have seen. So I've seen this happen to people who came by. That really sounds a lot about it. It sounds as though these stations are advertising for particular events. Gotcha. Okay. And again, we'll have to remove any stations from, from the stations. Um, what I want to do, the reason I'm only meeting the happy one here is that the FUL cards. Now, there seems to be a deliberate intent by some to pull back these cards. I want these cards printed. The cards, many people want these cards for the fancy thing to say, right, if I'm a record, so I'm a book, I might not get washing the washing machine, I won't treat them already. So I know the problems with the book. Right? The book has to remain because that's low. Uh, I don't actually. So instead of change, you know what I try to do is to beat the system and bypass the book. So you must have a book. But by printing the card, the card is not just there for convenience. The card is to be used as an avenue to prevent major corruption 
uh, being very open here. I actually have um, information of books being sold to person stuff. That's a new game now. So the book is now being sold, and with my name in um, sign. And now, hopefully, everything is firearm dealers that's involved in them, but illegal firearms. You don't want to have an illegal firearm, police officer. So we print about 5,000 books from the printry. They take 100, we are going to check. You all heard that? This officer, this person who is at the senior level of the TTPS, is saying that he is aware of corruption taking place with the booklets even. That booklets are being printed and they're being sold to people illegally. Now if you are at a senior level inside the police service and you become aware of these things, why has this not led to an investigation and charges? If you are saying in a meeting explicitly that booklets being printed and more booklets than than uh, more booklets than are necessary are being printed and they're then being sold to people why is nothing done about that you are saying that you have knowledge of this you know no investigation nothing so this and it's out it's explained the book gets printed it gets stamped it gets sold to somebody for ten thousand dollars police stop you in a roadblock you show it to them and you know, there's no issue about whether whether or not you act the 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 gun that you have is a le is a is legally is a legal gun or an illegal gun imagine that a police officer a senior ranking police officer at that sitting in a meeting and telling people who sell in firearms that these booklets the fuel booklets are being sold on the black market so they're coming out of the government printry they're being stamped they're being sold for ten thousand dollars and people who have illegal guns are now passing their illegal guns off as legal guns because of these booklets and nothing was done right and nothing was done it's you all know i said i i don't get paid enough in, in this case i really don't get paid it's always somewhere to be the system the card is going to be used as the ultimate avenue now to prevent that in a roadblock or whatever and to make sure the person has a legitimate if you will but more importantly the reason i want this card is twofold the card is to be right now we have firearm dealers here and rangers where With these, with these five firearms, somebody might be a firearm leader and have a million rounds. And he could easily, I'm not saying this being done, he could easily sell 200,000 rounds to the underworld. And I would not do. I need those cards now. So if it is you have one in your range, and somebody comes to the range and they, fire and they want to use 100 rounds, it swipes. So I'm, we need to rewind this a little bit because I want you all to hear this bit about bullets. Because this bit about bullets is important, right? So he starts saying that the way in which he wants to counter the corruption has taken place with the bullet, with the booklets, the illegal booklets, is to bring a card system in place. Now they're not going to replace the booklet system because the booklet system is law, right? And because it's enshrined in law, they have to keep the booklet system. So he's keeping the booklet system, but he also wants a card system to run parallel to this booklet system. And then he starts talking about bullets and the issue with bullets so i'm rewinding a bit and replaying so you might you're going to be hearing stuff that you heard already but i want to i want us to i want everybody to listen to this thing about bullets and to make sure the person has a legitimate if you will but more importantly the reason i want this card is twofold the card is to be right now we have firearm dealers here and rangers where with these with these five firearms Somebody might be a firearm leader and have a million rounds. And he could easily, I'm not saying this being done, he could easily sell 200,000 rounds to the underworld. And I would not do. I need those cards. So, based on what he just said there, somebody could have an FUL and they could have a, you know, could have a license to have a gun. And 
the dealers could be selling ammunition illegally to the underworld. I'm trying to wrap my brain around that. So if it is you have a low range and somebody comes in the range and they fire and they want to use 100 rounds, it swipes. So now if you have 1 million, it automatically will minus 100, minus 50, minus whatever. So if we come to run on it, we know how much ammunition we still have. That is going to eliminate greatly the possibility of the underworld. Gun getting in here easy. The ammunition is a problem for them. So the easy aspect. So if they can bring in um, the ammunition truly from the legal points of entry, they will try to get through the legitimate um, agencies. So that is why it is we need the card. The card also is going to be a major avenue. We have probably about 90% of persons who have a firearm have never touched a firearm in five years. So if the, everybody wants a gun, and they don't understand the importance of training with a gun. And that's the reason why the card is. The card is I intended for the card to be used as an avenue that every, this way I need your input now, every, it could be every year or every two years. This is going to be benefit to the ring, the rules with ranges, um, especially, that every year, could be every year or two years, I want you to have a, you want a gun, go on the range. I need to make sure that what is going to do is ensure accurate fire to prevent you shooting in the wrong direction that can cause harm to someone else. It's going to ensure you are to prevent negligent discharge. When the police tell, sometimes more is safe to be outside and police station at times. So you can discharge the fire. And that's because police officers, it's not mandatory for them to go on a range. Um, clean any weapon. Some people have not touched their weapon in a safe for 10 years. And then when they decide to pull it out, if a situation takes place, they're going to get a stoppage. So the whole concept of this is to make sure that persons know how to use their weapon, how to clean their weapon, how to prevent a negligent discharge. Because if they don't use a weapon for several years, they will definitely get the safety rules. So at this point, the ranges will come in. And that's why we need to make sure these ranges are certified and authorized. We have some issues with the EMA involvement. I am basically the Minister of National Security as it pertains to the ranges. Um, we have indoor ranges, but we have outdoor ranges. And honestly, we do not, I really prefer you, you can come and in, 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 intervene here. How are these ranges, the ranges, are they being established, are they certified, are they being monitored? We have serious issues with ammunition. A spencial, for some strange reason, this country a spencial is seen as ammunition. So if you keep a spencial and you decide to transport it, something could happen as well, that we're not talking about. But everybody who has a range and you know how range, how do you get rid of your spencial? Do you bury it or then you bury an ammunition? Please, what's it? I'm going to pause here. I'm actually going to stop um, playing the recording at this point. That would have been, that's the first 22 minutes of the meeting that I would have played for you and there is a whole hour again of meeting to go and it, it gets more and more interesting as the meeting goes on. What I'm considering doing is um, do, just l l doing a recording where it's just the meeting alone, me not ne necessarily being a part of that recording and putting it up on social media. But I have to double check a couple of things before I do that, right? Because of course, I don't want to put myself at, at any risk where this recording is concerned, um, legal or otherwise. So in the course of this meeting, you all would have heard a range of things being discussed there. And yes, agreed, Charlie Charles. It was chilling, it was scary, and it was very sad. And it was chilling, scary, and sad for a range of reasons. You have members of the TTPS and firearms dealers in the country sitting down in a meeting and also range operators sitting down in a meeting and discussing an industry not discussing how are we going to keep the society our society be as safe a space as possible not discussing what exactly do we want to have as a gun culture for this country so for me that's the first position i want to start from what kind of gun culture do we want to have in trinidad and tobago do we want Trinidad and Tobago to be a place where people just walk into a hardware, walk into a store, walk into a grocery, walk into a shop anywhere and purchase a gun? Is that the sort of society that we want where everybody can have a gun and everybody could walk around with a gun and everybody, well, because they can have a gun, can therefore use a gun? Is that the sort of society we want? And if we're saying that is the sort of society we want, then can we really and truly every day of the week 
every day of life be up in arms about how much guns it have here and how much killing taking place because we are a society where people are very impulsive people do foolish things all the time we're seeing that already for the second half of the year we ain't talk about the first half of the year yet for the second half of the year four persons four women would have been murdered by legal guns so you're looking at a situation where a meeting gets held and we sit down and we're talking and the people in the meeting are sitting down and talking about expanding an industry and they're talking about expanding an industry where in truth and in fact because of the firearms act the commissioner of police in this country based on the firearms act is the person that has the most power when it comes to the importation of guns and ammunition because it is the commissioner of police who had to sign off on every single importation of guns and ammunition in this country yes the commissioner of police that is who has that power according to the firearms act anytime a dealer wants to be able to bring in guns and ammunition the commissioner of police has to sign off on it down to the army if the army need to be able to bring in those things i believe the army makes its um, arrangements through the office of the prime minister but still the commissioner of police has to be the person who signs off so any guns that are being imported here legally through legal channels right any guns that are going to be imported here through legal channels will be happening through that office has that office has to have oversight regardless of who is the commissioner of police eh? regardless of who is the commissioner of police there must be that level of oversight now i asked a couple questions because i wanted to be clear about what the process was beforehand um when i say beforehand what was the process like before 2018 because we became aware of what the process was like um after 2018 through various express reports so there was all of this talk in the interview in the in the recording that you would have heard about um about the um, police stations being at the, the, the root cause so i asked i say if rhoda barrett want to get a gun what happened prior to 2018 so i'm going to explain to you all what happened prior to 2018 if i went to get a gun prior to 2018 I filled out an application I submitted the application and the application at the I would have to submit it um, at my at the police office the police station sorry the police station in my neighborhood right in my district so I in Dago Martin I had to go to the Four Roads police station submit the application and the application then gets sent up to police headquarters I'm told it went directly to the commissioner of police right because they have they would there would be an office there for that and then when it starts being processed there an investigator in my um policing division would then be asked to do the necessary investigations into me so an investigator so it goes up to um police headquarters police headquarters within two months because i'm told that you know within two months it must be acted on within two months um somebody within my policing division is then asked to investigate as well instructed not asked because it's not a request per se it's an instruction they uh, they instructed to be to begin an investigation to open a file and they have to um look into my background make me um you know um do my background checks thereafter if that file then goes back to the um goes back up to the commissioner's office indicating that i am you know that i've passed i've I passed muster in terms of the background checks then i have to do like psych eva a psych evaluation and i think a medical and of course they have to ensure that i've got things like a safe in the house to be able to store the gun that sort of thing that that is when a complete file now is put together 
and that completed file goes to the commissioner of police and the commissioner of police has to review the file making sure of course that the, the the things the boxes that need to be ticked are ticked so when i'm hearing in this meeting that files that that ful application files are being signed blindly it now helps me to understand why in the express stories that i would have been reading in 2021 and the early part of 2022 it helps me to understand why we were hearing about people whose files didn't have anything attached in it no certificate of good car good character no background checks no psychological evaluations nothing of the sort because if you are signing blindly as claimed then basically the commissioner of police who really and truly is the most senior investigative officer in the police service is saying that if a, if a commissioner is signing blindly, then that commissioner is not doing his basic job, which is to investigate and to ensure that all of the, all of the criteria that a, an applicant is supposed to meet, they've met. Yes, thank you very much, Emerald. If everyone in the household is sound and have no objections to you holding an FUL, correct. Because if it's a situation where I live in with people and they have an objection to me owning a firearm, I can't, oh, I can't, I'm not supposed to be able to own a firearm. So if I with a man and the man decide after he and I together, he going to apply for a gun or he going to apply for more guns. I am supposed to be able to weigh in on whether or not I'm comfortable with the person owning a gun and having a gun in the house. So I am there and I'm thinking to myself, okay, based on what I was told about pre- 2018 applications is not the is not at the level of the stations because if the application is just being submitted in the station and then going up to the 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 fire the firearms unit at police headquarters then it still remains at police headquarters where the action taken place because again based on what i was told once the divisional person has done the investigation, that file is going right back up to the firearms unit up in headquarters and it stays there. And if you put in an application, the application, once it goes past two years, if you apply and your application expire and two years pass, your application has expired and you have to reapply like new all over again. So the way I see it, once that file reach back in the firearms unit the that is that is housed within the the, the headquarters of the ttps it is there that the persons who 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 dealing up with those with the processing of those files those are the persons that are actually in a position to look for bribes not the officers who collect in your application form because when they collect your application form, your application form has to go up to the commissioner. So if, if you say, if you're saying that police officers at the station blocking applications going forward, and you are a senior police officer and you are aware of this, why didn't you do something about the police officers who were blocking applications at the station level? So now let's jump forward to what was taking place after 2018. After 2018, you had a situation where all of us, well, let me not say all of a sudden, where there's an expansion in the number of dealers, right? Firearms dealers. Because you went from about, what, eight dealers and now they were up to, you know, th either 13 or 18 dealers, right? Who had, who, who could now be bringing in for arms and ammunition into the country the expansion of the industry and then there's a setup of this compliance unit within the firearms um unit um of the of the ttps and this compliance unit was supposed to be fast tracking applications going through applications and fast tracking applications but here's the thing that has me concerned about the process and it gets discussed in this meeting later on and the senior police official is discussing it. 
firearms dealers, businessmen, businessmen were doing the background checks for their clients. So I, Rhoda Barrett, want a gun and I go into one of these dealers and I tell the dealer I want to be able to get a gun. Up to now, me and understand where or how a dealer have a role to play here, right? But let me go with it. I go to a dealer and I tell the dealer I want a gun. So the dealer gets the application form for me. As a matter of fact, the dealer provided me with a whole packaged service. They're doing the application forms. They're providing my, psych my, my, my psychological evaluation, my medical, any of the other things that, that I need done. They're doing all of those things and putting those things together and sending it to the TTPS. Remember, I tell all you, the firearms dealers in this country are not part of the TTPS. In the pre-2018 process that I lay out for all you, it have nothing about no FUL dealer there. Because the FU, the, hear me FUL dealer, firearms dealer. The firearms dealer comes into the picture after I have been approved for a firearm. And then I go to a dealership, purchase a gun, and ideally I should go to somebody who is a certified trainer for them to show me how to use the gun so that there is a certain amount of competence that i have with using the gun in the actual process there isn't any room for the firearms dealer but in the process that i am listening to in this meeting firearms dealers doing background checks and i want to know one simple question i have here who authorized firearms dealers to do background checks? Who authorized them? In the process that is laid out, right, for applications for, 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 for FUL. And in that process, it would be part of a, the police standing orders. So in that process that is laid out in the police standing orders, where in that process, firearms dealers, where in that process, businessmen are linked where where in the process because that's what i want to understand you know i sit down here and i listen to this meeting and i think into myself okay we have the ttps in a meeting we have the firearms dealers in a meeting and the purpose of the meeting is not to discuss how to improve um a process or how to eradicate the corruption right that the dealers may be may be part may be party to because according to the stories that we've been hearing what we're hearing is people paying tens of thousands of dollars through these dealers to be able to get the applications fast-tracked right that is what that is the story tongue say People spending all kind of 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars depending on the type of gun they want, depending on whether they want variations or not. They're spending that kind of money. I hear up to 150 thousand dollars, right? Depending on the kind of guns you want to be able to get their applications fast tracked based on the actual process that is that was laid out for me by a police officer. There is no room or leeway inside there for paying any money for fast tracking. There's a basic application form you fill out, you submit, and then thereafter, there are a range of things you have to do. So this set of money, the tens of thousands of dollars, and this set of money that's spending, or allegedly spending, I want to know, well, okay, where in this process dealers come in? Because in this meeting, you're hearing the senior police officer talking about how much a Glock being sold for by dealers. That a Glock costing $7,000, but a dealer might say to a client, give me $12,000 and I will put together a package. It here in the meeting. So the Glock went from costing $7,000 in terms of purchasing a Glock to, well, if you give me $12,000, I will be able, I'll put together a package and I will get your application fast track. It there in, in the meeting. And it is being said in the most casual way. And I am I listen, my my mind continues to be blown. I'm like, but 
if these are police officers or if these are persons representing the interests of the police service how are we casually discussing all of the navigation of this corruption within the industry without even talk without even without even acknowledging that this is corruption that needs to be tackled how and then the next thing that they eventually got to was the whole business of bullets and ranges and the disposal of bullets i was today years old right today years old november the 6 2022 today when i find out or realize or arrived at the understanding that the ttps has no role to play in certifying gun ranges it is the trinidad and tobago defense force right so you have a situation where people who get approved i'm not sure how or why but they get approval to run gun range sit down in a meeting with gun dealers and with members of the ttps and nobody from the defense force in the meeting so nobody from the defense force in the meeting to explain to them how range is supposed to be set up how people are supposed to be certified to, to um to, to, to open ranges and how spent shells supposed to be disposed of because the defense force has oversight of all of those things it is the defense force that is certify a range and let you know how the range is supposed to be laid out ema is supposed to be a part of that as well it is the defense force that is certify people to be able to open ranges and it is the defense force that is responsible for the disposal of spent shells on a gun range. But nobody from the defense force in that meeting and nobody from the Ministry of National Security in that meeting. So the people who are supposed to be there to be talking about law legislation, because of course, you're talking about this industry and you're talking about no advertising in the industry and expanding the industry, but nobody nobody is there to talk about whether this industry is legal whether it is legislated and whether there are actual rules and laws and guidelines for the expansion of this industry in this meeting the irony of the situation is there are multiple lawyers in the meeting right multiple lawyers in the meeting and one lawyer who is also a firearms dealer actually speaks up and says part of the problem here is there might be the need for, for legislative oversight. Well, listen, I yet again, I almost killed Kitty. <clears throat> so, does a commissioner of police really sign off? on fuel applications blindly that making sense to earlier that you would go from 200 fuel um 200 people with fuel licenses to 2000 people with fuel licenses and you're signing off blindly on the fuel applications might that be how we end up in a situation where People who ain't have psych evaluations and who ain't have char character, um, certificate of good character and them kind of things. Might that be how we have p persons like that ending up with these guns? And then the variations. How does one person need a gun for protection? And I don't have a quarrel with that. You need a gun for protection. And then decide that you need 5, 10, 15, 20 and upwards more guns whether it is for personal protection whether it's to protect your estate whether it's for um for sporting purposes so let's say let us say you are a hunter and you own land and you own a business right so hunter land business so you want a gun for recreational purposes you want a gun for your estate because you are a wild animal on your estate and thing and then you want a gun for personal protection when you get beyond three firearms three guns how the investigative the investigative officer because every single time you want a, a variation 
it has to an application has to go in and the invest uh, an investigation has to be done and a case has to be made or not made because you have to recommend the person or not recommend the person how are we explaining and justifying all of these guns how are we saying this person who already owns two personal firearms need five more personal firearms like how much personal firearms you need so to be able to protect yourself and how are we explaining persons needing automatic weapons and multiple automatic weapons are that this does not make sense a lot of it just does not make sense to me so to have listened to this meeting and to listen to this meeting between members of the police service and firearms dealers talking about an industry and how we run in this industry and I want ideas for this industry an expansion of this industry and we have no members of the you know no members of national security present no members of the defense force present and we're not discussing it from a legislative point of view and we're not discussing how to root out the corruption I say to myself boy water more than flower you know water more than flower so I want to talk about this whole business of choosing your men wisely a woman gets killed she gets killed by her husband and I guess maybe because we don't know what to say because the trauma of yet another woman being killed gets to us we make stupid statements like well women need to choose their men wisely the prime minister made that statement several years ago must see around 2016 2017 somewhere thereabouts and it would have been at the at, it would have been at um, a, it would it would have been in the aftermath of a murder a young woman would have been killed and she would have been killed by her domestic partner and you all need to understand why that statement is incredibly inappropriate and incredibly ridiculous as human beings we don't show people we real self we don't show people we true self when you now meet people you just put on your best face when you now meet people you just make sure that you put on your best clothes you put on your babe you're, 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 you're smelling nice you're looking nice and you're behaving in a particular way right it does take a long period of time sometimes before you start to see the real person you just have to peel back layers before you start to see the real person further to that many of us male and female have grown up in environments where we live around so much problematic and dysfunctional behavior right we live among so much problematic and dysfunctional behavior that we don't even know what red flags are when red flags show in the self because we tend to think that domestic violence here is only a man lashing you or a woman lashing you domestic violence comes in a range of ways it could be emotional it could be verbal it could be psychological mary james you could agree with the prime minister all you want i don't agree with the prime minister and i'll tell you why i don't know you i could meet you now and you could show me the best face possible and we could lie with each other for weeks for months and it might take a long time before i actually start to see toxic behavior from him right all of you who are agreeing with it oftentimes it takes you a while before you start to see toxic behavior it, um um showing itself in a person there are many people who get into relationships and it is only after they have gotten married to the person they start to see the problems or they start to experience problems with the person if you meet somebody who on the surface well educated have a good job doing well for themselves, and looking very well put together how are you going to know that that person might be emotionally abusive how are you going to know that that person might be coping with um mental well-being issues there's a num there are a range of things that you may not be aware of there are also a range of things that we are not told that we're not socialized into seeing 
as problematic behavior. So people could have insecurity issues. Growing up, nobody ever tell you if the man insecure, run away from, leave the man. Nobody has ever said that to you. Nobody's ever say if the woman insecure, um, do, um, don't get involved with the woman. The most they will tell you is, well, you know, you could try. And well, if you're, in, if you're involved in religion and thing, pray on it and pray and think and that kind of thing. So, but what are we leaving for situations where women have gotten involved with men or men have gotten involved with women? And when they see the red flags and, this, and decide to put an end to the relationship, the person then comes and decides to put an end to the person's life. How is that a situation of choose your men and women wisely? Rena, you're saying that there are red flags that we ignore, but that is to assume that people know how to look for the red flags, Rena. Not everybody knows how to look for the red flags. Not everybody raised to understand what a red flag is. There are lots of red flags. Yes, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that there aren't red flags, but not everybody knows how to identify a red flag. Further to that, not everybody knows how to step away from the red flag. If we grow up thinking that this is what love is, and plenty of us have grown up being taught to accept all kinds of unacceptable things as love. All kinds of unacceptable things we, act, we think, well, this means the person love me. So they're possessive, that means the person love me. They're oppressive, that means the person love me. They want me to go nowhere by myself, that means the person love me. No, but we were raised to think that all of those things mean love. So when I hear people repeating that statement, Choose your men wisely. I think that comes from a place of not understanding our culture of violence, our culture of trauma here, and the fact that people don't always know what the red flags are, and people don't always know how to identify the red flags, and people don't always know how to step away from the red flags. And if we are going to go down the road with that statement of choose your men wisely, then I'm going to say this. This evening, we talked about at least two persons who ain't doing their job well. We talked about Fitzgerald Hines and we talked about a former commissioner of police. In both instances, those persons were selected by the prime minister. Do I now turn around and say that the Prime Minister not choosing his men wisely? Because we are seeing how regularly these selections are having a negative impact on our life. So since all you believe that you could tell from up front precisely how persons are and how problematic and how toxic people could be, and you would know from the jump, leave that you shouldn't be with this person, then explain to me. How are we ending up with so many misfits being selected for various positions here? Right? How are we ending up with that? So no, I disagree with the comment about choose your men wisely. Because there are a lot of people, men and women, who don't know how to recognize unhealthy, toxic behavior. Who don't know how to recognize red flags and who don't know how to step away from an unhealthy relationship when they realize they're in an, unhe in an unhealthy relationship. And that's why I'm going to leave you all. So thank you so much for joining me and for spending this much time with me this evening. And, um, you know, I will see you all. I'll see you all next week. Yeah, I'll see you all on Sunday. When I see you all on Sunday, I want to be able to discuss, I want to be able to discuss um, guns coming in illegally, right? So we're going to be looking at the legal um, entry of guns into the country and a couple other things as well. I want it to be all about guns, 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 guns. I hope you all have a good week. Take care.